Hello, and welcome to this research software hour on Intro to GitHub. This is a special week because this is being done in conjunction with some Alta University training. It's been advertised as an Intro to GitHub course. So research software hour is something we started around the time that remote work started. So basically a more informal way of reaching out to people and giving demos of practical topics. Um, yeah, so we've been doing it on and off for a bit more than a year now. This and is like the 25th episode, maybe? Something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've covered all kinds of things, a lot based on Git or software testing or shell usage or Conda or well, all these kinds of practical things that might be interesting to people. So then what? Um, so what's this workshop? So we had a request for an intro to GitHub workshop, and we said, well, why not do it as part of Research Software Hour? So now here we are. So I'm Richard Darst. I work at Alto University in the Science IT team. Um, Radovan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, so nice to see all of you. Looking forward to the session. My name is Hadevan Bast, calling in from Tromso, Norway. It's windy and autumny here. And yeah. with us is also Jano. Hello. So I am a research software engineer from Aalto University. And I'm, in fact, calling in from Oulu, where it's also grey and <laughs> um, wet. Yeah. So um, I guess the first practical point of view is how to communicate back with us. So this is being broadcasted on Twitch, but you don't need to use the Twitch chat. So what we see, what I've just pasted there, and is also down below in the channel description, is a link to um, something called HackMD. And if you open that, and then click on the edit icon above, which is right up here. You can go from view mode to edit mode. So this is a public document and anyone can come here and write a question such as what is Git? And then we will see it and discuss the answer on the show either right away or sometime at the end. We'll also use this to paste links and other stuff that we do as we're talking about it. So instead of having slides, we have this, which sort of assembles the notes as we do them. And we will, as we go, we will then copy paste some some notes and, and bullet points. And, and I also want to reemphasize that it's really better to ask questions in the HackMD than on Twitch chat, because I have only one screen and I just can't fit all these windows into the screen. So I'm, I'm watching the, the HackMD for questions. Right, yeah. And please don't write any names there except for our names because it will be published as part of the result of the workshop. So should we begin? I guess the general summary of the workshop is this here. So oh, when asking questions, always write at the bottom because that's where we will see them. So we see, for example, questions here. So yeah, what is well, what are we covering here? So there's three main points here. One, GitHub can be used by yourself. So you're not working with anyone. It just serves as sort of the central place you keep your stuff to keep it organized and somewhat shareable. The next level is for small groups. So for example, your research group, you know everyone that's using it. So you share, you collaborate, you sort of track things and people can work on the same code together relatively easily. And then the next level is for a large community. So let's say you have a project and it becomes popular and other people start using it. Well, they can also start contributing. Um, and, it's, and it's really a progression. Um, like I would say all big community projects, they have started as small projects for yourself. And, and, um, and especially the backup part to have a, one place where is the latest version and is backed up. Yeah. And it will not get lost. That's really a good starting point. Or maybe it's also fair to say that although we will maybe focus on GitHub and show GitHub examples, many things that we will mention, they also 
it exists on GitLab. So it's another platform, very similar, right. similar ideas, similar solutions. Yeah. You want to start with the survey. So here I'm pasting into the notes, quick survey. So let's learn how to do HackMD surveys. So everyone come open it, which I will repaste into the Twitch chat. Mm. Should I screen share and cast my vote? Will it help if I show how I vote? Oh, uh, I have it open here. It's probably fine. So okay. we vote like, we'll make a character there. So I say, mm, you usually use O. So O for yes, or here we're using eyes. I've opened an issue on GitHub, yes. I've created a pull request there. So let's watch the bar graph get assembled here. And I'm seeing a lot more yeses than noes here, but maybe there is a bit of an observation bias for people who use or have opened the HackMD. But anyway, since this is being recorded and is a reference for later, we're going to go through everything. I guess we should emphasize what you see today. Won't, we're not going to teach you how to do everything right now. There's good tutorials for that. Instead, we're going to talk about why you would want to do things and what is available and what's relevant for your use cases. And then you're well prepared to go study more yourself. So what's next? We have some, we're going to talk about what is Git. So yeah, we will talk about what is Git. Maybe we should have a look at an example, yeah. an actual example uh, to, uh, to discuss some of these topics. Yeah. So uh, Jarno, what is Git? <laughs> um, OK, good question. Um, Git is a program that you can use to track changes in a folder or in a set of files. That is essentially what it's for. Um, so it's a version control system. It, um, you can create snapshots of files that you have in your system and see how your project evolves. And um, when you run into problems and you have a bug in your code, you can go back and find where you introduce that, um, which makes it much easier to fix things. And um, if you're really desperate, also just to go back and continue from there. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, uh, this helps you do a lot other thing, a lot of other things as well. So, um, like with, through GitHub, you can collaborate, um, you can merge changes, or make uh, edit the same program in different places, and then figure out how to put those changes together. And, yeah. All sorts of useful stuff like that. Uh, so you mentioned it's used for code. Is it used for any other kind of projects? You can use it to track essentially anything. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a file on a computer, you can track it. It is best, though, with text files. So if the content is represented with, test, uh, with text, then Git will work really well. Yeah. And some, some good examples for things to track. So it was mentioned code, but it can be also data. It can be some configuration files, manuscripts, or the PhD thesis. So these are good things to put under version control. Yeah. Almost anything you might want to save while you're working on it. Yeah. If your computer crashes and you lose something important, uh, then that might be a good thing to keep in <laughs> Yeah. And so, I think at the beginning we start with like single person projects, uh, but it's incredibly powerful when several people work on something because then they have, they can actually agree on versions. So then I don't have to ask around like who has the latest version, where is the latest version. Yeah. We can work independently and together yeah. and we can together work on the same project. Yeah. I've seen people basically say that Git or some some sort of version control is basically basically required for reproducible science. But we assume that most people here know a bit about Git. But if you don't, that's okay. You can still follow most of what we're talking about, and we can give you some pointers to courses. So can someone give a demo of a Git repository? So maybe show the basics from 
a command line usage or something. Yes, I can do that. I will also paste an example into the ACMD. So this is a simple example that we might return to later. I will put it in the ACMD example. And I will take over the screen share here okay. to just need to find the right one. Just give me a sec. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm hopefully sharing the right thing now. Yes. How is the readability here? Looks good. OK, so this is a, this is a project which is now on my computer in a terminal. I will first look at it here through the terminal, but then I will also visit it on, on GitHub in the web interface. And I think the first thing I will try. So there are some files here. Uh, mm -hmm. We will come back to that later. Uh, so there's some documentation. There is some Python code, whatever that is. I will first look at Git log. So this project has a history. And here are the these snapshots that Jano talked about. Yeah. So a snapshot was done here in August 11, and another one. So that's the second snapshot here. OK. And this is the main thing, I guess. So basically, seeing what happened in the past and everything gets built on this. Right. OK. And then there is much more, but that's the that's the essence, really, be able to save my snapshots. Yeah. And then there are mechanisms to go back to them and compare them. So I can compare what happened between here and here. And, um, and now maybe let's have a look at the same thing on, on GitHub. I just need to switch to a different panel in my screen. So I will stop and mm -hmm. restart the share. So now switching to the browser. here. Just need to move the zoom out of the way. All right. And here we look at the same thing on GitHub. So that's the same project, the same files. And there, there were two commits. And here they are. And again, I can inspect what happened in these versions. So what, what happened here? Who did it? When, when we have a trace of all the changes. What, so, what else should we have a look at? Can you demonstrate making a commit, and then we can go on? Yes. Okay. I, I, again, I just I should use other panel. Maybe that's yep. sorry, if this is inconvenient. No, go ahead. So back to my terminal. Maybe we can also later show how to make a commit from the web interface. But I typically yeah. work here in on my computer, and um, what I will do is I will edit maybe the readme file. Mm -hmm. And I will do that with, so I'll open an editor in my case, Vim. Let's make a small change here. Um, so at the end of the file, I will adding some changes for demonstration. So I modify this file and git diff, I can now have a look, what did I change here locally? But I, I want to save this. I want to save this snapshot. And I want to make a commit. So I will stage it and commit. Git commit with a message that uh, change is made, adding a line during the stream. So, mm -hmm. um if you haven't used Git before, I and mean, all that's happening here really is that we are now saving the snapshot um, using Git. So Git add and Git commit. Um, if you do one and then you do the other, you have saved a file into well into Git. Yeah. Yes. So now there is a new commit here. This yeah. New snapshot, but it, it lives on my computer. But yeah. I can now share it with all of you. Yeah. And we'll get to that later. Well, okay. We'll show that in. A couple minutes. Yeah. Good. So yeah, and what we're just what we talked about here, we know it was fast, but this is not the main point of the session. So this is sort of assume that you know this, or you can read something else later. Actually, we have some good references to other courses for it. So maybe next we can talk about what is GitHub. So yeah, what's GitHub? 
So it's a commercial company, but it's also the web repository run by that company. So this is what Radovan just showed in his screen share. Um, and it's a place where so it's a place where we can store our repository, and I can I can upload my projects and I can share them. It's a place where we can collaborate. Yeah. It's a place where we can discuss. Yeah. Um, changes where we can collect issues. I think we will come to all of these a bit later. Yeah. So it's really about collaboration. Yeah. And again, I I remind that while we present GitHub, there is also GitLab. There are also other services which are very similar. So the idea is to have a web platform where we can share the code or data and collaborate on them. Right, yeah. So GitHub is closed source and commercial. GitLab is open source. And incidentally, it's also a company and they also have a free repository. But since it's open source, many universities and other organizations run their own internal GitLab. So for example, Alto University has version.alto.fi, which is a GitLab. The Code Refinery project has source.coderefinery.org, which is GitLab. And yeah, for the practical purposes, everything we talk about is pretty much the same between them. So um, it's just a slight difference of user interface and slight feature changes. You might have heard that there are some differences in what is actually available, um, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. you can maybe do some. Somebody has told said that you can do continuous integration in GitHub, uh, GitLab, um, and essentially now since a few years, uh, GitHub has implemented all of that. Yeah, and also the other way around. So <laughs> they really are basically the same at this point. Yeah, they basically locked in competition, and whoever does something new, the other one comes next. And well. I guess we can point out that GitHub is owned by Microsoft. So it would be an advantage for me to put, so if I want to decide where do I put my code or data, should I put it on the university server or on GitHub? What would be the pros and cons? Yeah, yeah I guess the biggest um, pro for GitHub is that people know about it and many people will default to it. So it is easier for people to find your code if it's on GitHub. Right, yeah. It used to be that GitHub didn't provide, you had to pay for free, for no, you had to pay for private repositories or teams with private repositories. But since Microsoft took over, now private repositories for both individual and teams are free. I guess. So, um... A possible downside, something that in fact did happen, as you mentioned, that Microsoft took, took over GitHub. Um, some um, people at that point decided to migrate, uh, to move all of their stuff into GitLab or their own GitLab instances. Yeah. And um, if that happens, you may use, uh, you may lose some data that's not actually in the repository itself. Mm -hmm. Things like issues and also things that, that we will be talking about in a, in a moment. Um, yeah. So maybe the biggest upside in um, putting it in your university's repository is that um, it is more stable or um, it will at least be at your university. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't uh, yeah. you don't expect to lose any data by changing to a different yeah. interface. Um, although as someone pointed out in a meeting I was in yesterday, GitHub probably has a longer life expectancy than anything run by our universities. Who knows how long until they say, okay, GitLab's not the thing, we're going to something else. So he had said that in his years at Alto, the number of different hosting solutions had changed quite frequently. So who knows? That's true. But of all of them, I'd say GitLab will probably last the longest. So, yeah. Oh, uh, hmm. What else? Are there any demos we'd like to give here? I think Radovan had already showed the GitHub things. 
Should we show a very major project on GitHub? No, let's do that later under the community section. Do you want to show about how to push and pull from? Um, oh, we have a good question coming up. The interfaces for GitHub. So yeah, there's the Git command line interface, which can be installed on Windows and Mac and Linux. Well, Mac and Linux come with Git by default. Um, and this is what we usually recommend for a code refinery. There's also GitHub Desktop, which is basically a big thing packaged by GitHub that includes Git and editors and all kinds of other nice things. I personally don't use that, but I think some people do and probably like it. Yeah, I'm on Linux, but I use a graphical interface mostly for Git. Um, because it allows me to see the changes um, marked in a in the text. Right. Um, yeah. What interface do you use? Um, the one built in for into the Atom text editor. Okay. It's mostly at the moment. That's VS a good, code also has a good one. That's a good point. Most advanced editors uh, or integrated development environments include Git integration. So you can do all of this straight from your editor, which is very nice. I also based it this GitHub command line interface because mm -hmm. the way I understood the question, it was more about command line interface to GitHub, not so much about like command line interface to Git. And then maybe I would go for the official one. Yeah. Yeah. Although there are nice alternatives also. Yeah. Yeah, that's news for me. Yeah. So then you can like do all basically everything you do on the web you can you can do from the command line. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. The division between what you do on the web and in GitHub and what you do in Git. For example, making a repository on GitHub is a GitHub operation. Pushing to that is a Git operation and is the same no matter what you use. Well, should we go on to a demo of pushing and pooling? Sounds good. So I think I should maybe try to take a portion of my screen so that I don't have to switch all the time. Mm -hmm. Will that be useful? But it will still switch. Mm. Mm. So I'm only starting window manager and it uh, and it retiles once it <laughs> once I screen share something. Interesting. But I will I will try. Okay. So back to the back to the command line. Um, I did this commit. Yes. Um, so just how, waiting until. Hmm? Yeah. So how does it know to send it to GitHub? How does it know what GitHub even is? Yeah, it will. What I will try in a moment is to send it to origin and. Origin is something that that I can find out where that is. The Git remote minus V. Okay. So that's the place I have cloned this repository from. Right. And I will send my change now to Origin, which means that it will send it to this web address, mm -hmm. which corresponds to this example repository. Yeah. Should we try that? Yeah, let's do it. And what I will do is I will push to origin the, in this case, this master branch. I think we didn't really, we really didn't really talk about what is a branch. Yeah. Well, maybe we can make some demo. I mean, I think that's probably more of for another course. Yeah. I think we should focus on the GitHub part. So ready to go? Ready to go? Yeah. And now it uploads yep. all the commits um, that I created locally, which was the one additional commit. And if I now reload, I just need to again stop share and restart share. Mm -hmm. I will switch to the browser. And here we are in the browser. So if I now visit my repository, there is now a new commit. Mm -hmm. Created 11 minutes ago. Sounds about right. 
Yeah, and shared here on this uh, on this master branch. Okay. Yeah. And later we should have a look on how other people can make changes. How can they suggest changes to to yeah. to this repository? Yeah. So for now, what are the basic things you'd configure in a repository? So I think mm -hmm. first there's, is it under a user or is it under an organization? Yeah. So in this case, it's under my user. If, if this project starts to, because now it's just my project, but if then several people start collaborating on it, we may decide later to move it under an organization. Yeah. So and, if I look at my uh, then, account, so here are some organizations. So later we might decide. So we have this research software, our organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To, and the point to here is you can have, mm -hmm. instead of being owned by one person, you have multiple people. So for example, there can be all of the yeah. postdocs in your group are the administrators, and then you have everyone else as a member and someone from the outside can collaborate on just one repository. So I think- So um, is it possible to collaborate um, if you're not in the group? Mm. So I think, do you mean someone that's from outside making a change or a suggestion? Or if I want to make a change to relevance repository? Actually, yes. And we'll talk about that as one of the last things today. And this is yeah, just um, yeah. I just essentially wanted to point out that um, while the user management is important, um, it doesn't mean that other people cannot um, right. cannot edit it or cannot uh, suppose uh, suggest changes. Yeah, right. And this is really what made I think Git and GitHub and GitLab so popular is that they made it really easy to suggest changes even if you are not part of, even if this is not your repository. Right, yeah. Like, for example, I guess 20 years ago, if you wanted to contribute to some project and the code is online, you make a change, you make a diff of it, showing what the changes are. You might email it to a mailing list or the author, and they have to open it, look at it, then apply the diff to the code, commit it, and then all of that, which is really slow. Yeah. And now, it's just so amazing that there is some project online I'm using and I say, oh, there's something I don't like about it. And I can just go and suggest a change and someone can click a single button and accept it. Uh, what else? So um, that is uh, essentially what the owners then can do um, in addition to changing the settings in the repository and doing some administrative things. Mm -hmm. um, any change that actually goes into the repository needs to be approved by an owner at some point. Yes. Hmm. What, well, what other properties before we go on to small groups? So they can be public or private, which we yeah. already discussed. And just like Radovan said, the single source of truth is very important. Like whenever I go to a new computer and I ask where is my code, what I've been working on. I know there's one place to look, GitHub, and that's really valuable. So what about, oh, go ahead. So, um, well, there are issues um, which are useful for tracking the changes that you want to make yeah. in the future, for uh, jotting down things that are broken at the moment, but also for other people to give you feedback yeah. in, in, if the repository is open. That brings us to the next topic in the notes. So Git for small teams. So we already talked about the organizations and that's basically the team. And we talked about the user management sum. So now the issues and pull requests. So yeah, can you tell us a bit more about issues? Does someone Should have some- Should we look at um, a real project or later? Yeah, why not? Do you wanna go so... into something big? Like NumPy or is that too big? Hmm. I guess we could do NumPy. So NumPy is basically the standard Python array package. 
and here we see on its GitHub, okay, now we see it, we see there's 2.1 thousand issues and 259 pull requests active right now. So let's look at what the issues include. So they are typically about problems, but it sometimes also about questions. Yeah. Also, or suggestions. It can also be a change suggestion. But in this case, we see like bug, 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 documentation. This is a huge project. Yeah. Proposal. So there is an idea for a change. Each issue has a number. And, and in each issue, maybe let's open one with a bit more discussions here. In an issue, one can have a discussion. Um, so one can ask questions, give a suggestion, one can discuss code. So there is a discussion thread. Do you and think? Then, mm -hmm, go ahead. Do you think this would be useful for a single research group? Absolutely, because then the decisions. So it can be about enhancement proposals, and then mm -hmm. problems are all collected in one place. The discussion is close to where the problem is reported, so it's not in some email or in some document on my hard drive, but it's actually in one place. So then when a new student joins in, hits the same problem, maybe has a, has a possibility to either report the problem or define the problem and read up on it. Mm -hmm. So definitely useful for also small projects, even for a single person project, just to have things in in the same place, close to the close to the repository. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, I use issues for, even for projects where I'm the only um, only person working on it, and there it, it becomes more of a to-do list, but um, it is still useful as a to-do list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. And each issue has a number uh, that I can refer to later. I can refer to it in the code, in the commit, in pull requests, which we will discuss in a moment. Yeah. Should, Should we... we demonstrate creating an issue? Yeah, sounds good. Um, but not here, but we will go back to the toy repository, right? Yeah. <laughs> sounds good. Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, I don't know if we actually want to maybe do this a bit later, but um, I was thinking of creating an issue on Radovan's repository. Mm. Oh, okay. so you, yeah. you want, do you want a screen? Or... Yeah. Um, okay. I can share. One. Okay, so now okay. we've got so this is Radovan's. Yarno's view of Radovan's repository. Yeah. Okay. So, in order to create an issue, I go to issues here. Um, in fact, let me open Cauliflower Tacos and see. Um, I think I would want to add some chili in the cauliflower taco recipe. And I think they, this is quite self-explanatory, but um, it's still good practice to give a, pro a proper description of what you want to, um, what your problem or what your issue is. Okay, also there is give you more context there because it, it can be useful it can be based on some discussion or just to give more background so that's a, it's a good thing to do yeah so now that we're here this brings us to the next point which is making the pull request so we've yep. been mentioning this in the past but the basic idea is mm, well so I saw yeah. books. So, sorry. Yeah. So, um, essentially, to make a pull, so a pull request is a way I can make changes or suggest changes to Radovan's repository without actually being an owner or any way involved in the project. So, to do that I, first, yeah. Just before going that there, because I saw a good description of this, and I think it's in Nadia Agbar's book on that. It's a bit like suggested changes to a collaborative document. So we are, I think, all used to it on Google Docs. Um, that 
so I'm, I can actually make suggestions to recommend even if I don't have right permissions. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else can review them and decide to accept them or not. And it's really the same idea here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so should I just go ahead and make a pull request? Yeah, why not? Are um, you going to do it from the command line or from the web interface? I could use the web interface just to demonstrate that at the same time, but is that then mm. too many new things at once? Yeah. Well, the first thing I I'll mean, have to do is to make a copy of the repository that I can actually edit. Yeah. So I will start with that. Um, you, could, you could actually try to do from the web. Yeah, I think maybe web interface. Yeah. yeah, maybe yeah. web interface yeah. is good. So it has all the concepts there, and then we can point you to the course to learn more command line details later on. Yeah. OK. So, maybe uh, so I'm about to create the fork. Yeah. So maybe we should make sure we emphasize what we're doing here. So Radovan has a project. Yarno has no permissions to access that project other than it being public on GitHub. And Yarno would like to make an improvement there. Yeah. So this might not be the situation that happens inside of a research group, but because the research group might already have access to it, but you could still make the pull request because it means that you'll get someone else to look at what you do before it becomes final, which basically lowers the barrier to contributing. Like you don't have to worry, oh, what if I do something wrong? You do it, it gets reviewed and then goes in. Yeah, so, so I suppose right now I do not have right access to Radovan's repository, mm -hmm. um, but even if I did, I might do it this way just so that Radovan will see the changes before um, he approves them. Yeah. Or well, that he has to approve them before they become actually changes in the repository. No, no, can you make your window a little bit less tall to fit in the screen? Better? Tall. This way? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Okay. So you want to contribute um, from web interface. So, yeah. so first, um, a fork is my own copy of repository. And to create one, I will click here. Mm -hmm. um, so. I will do it under my own username. You can choose any of your groups mm -hmm. from here. Click there. OK, now it's creating a copy of the repository. It takes a short moment. Here we are. OK. And I so see... now this is under my username and not Radovan's. But it tells me that it's forked from Radovan's username. Right. Yeah. So okay. it, it's otherwise maybe not not um, that clear because I see Radovan's um, logo here and he's <laughs> made some changes here. But yeah. you can always check here where you actually are. Yep. OK, so I'm going to open the recipe. And then I click here to edit the file. So it opens a raw view of the actual text in the file. Um, and I can edit it. So. I will add the words some chili. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is my suggestion. Now I need to scroll down a bit, yes, to see uh, where I actually saved the file. So this is already creating a commit. So earlier we did this um, edit of, uh, rather than edited the file, then did git add, and then it git commit. Um, this does all of those at once. So I uh, need to give a title. Uh, for the commit, and this will then be visible in the uh, Git history. So we'll see what that means in a moment. But um, essentially, you'll need to give a title to the change you are making. So uh, the title that I'm writing in is add some chili. And you have option to create a new branch. Um, I'll just stick to my master branch because um, this is already a separate <laughs> repository. But I, I, I really recommend to always create a new branch. Uh, OK, let's do it right. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so it's immediately suggesting that I open a pull request. OK. Against my own master branch. Hmm. So. 
I think the interface here is not really actually suggesting what I wanted to do. It created a new branch with my change, but I didn't yeah. want to create a pull request immediately against my own master branch. Right. I want to create mm -hmm. one against Radovan's repository. If so you... I can, yeah. Yeah, huh. It doesn't even have the compare across forks here that I used to see. Well, we're learning something ourselves. Yeah, so this is, um, I'm kind of realizing as I go that this is what it does. So it, yeah. it, it's assuming that I want to change my own master branch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I would need to, I created a new branch. So um, I would need to create a um, pull request against my master branch, but I don't want to do that. So I wanted to suggest this to oh, yeah. I wanted to suggest this to oh, Radovan. Oh, there it is. It's compare across forks in the description. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think though so um like I could just click yeah. that. That's yeah. probably what I would I should do. Mm -hmm. Let me open the main um, view of my repository again, mm -hmm. just for a while. So this is what you will see if you use, um, if you do this in the command line and then push to your repository and then go to the main website, this is what um, we're probably all used to seeing. So um, then you click this compare and pull request, mm -hmm. uh, this big green button. And it does what I'm expecting it to do. It goes and compares against Radovan's okay. um, master branch. Yeah. OK, but let's go back. So this is what Git, GitHub opened by default. And I'm going to click Compare Across Forks. Mm -hmm. And then choose Radovan's um, version. OK. So it already gives a title. This is actually the title of um, the commit I made. So this will also now be the title for the pull request. And Do you want to cross-reference the issue? Yes, um, it's a good idea to do that. But um, for that, well, I'll need to open the issues and see. So I don't want to close this window. <laughs> So I will click uh, open this in a new tab, just um, right. so that people can follow along. It's not too confusing. Um, there is yeah. one issue here. This is mine, the one I opened, and it's number one. OK, so uh, to reference the issue, I need to know the number. Yeah. And this is the pull request again um, that I'm making. So I will say. Add some chili to the recipe to describe what the pull request does. Mm -hmm. And then um, fixes, closes. You can use a number of keywords here. Fixes issue number one. It actually suggests a um, suggest, uh, issue number one. It's the only one there, but it mm -hmm. lists the others if there were others. OK. So yeah, it's good to reference the issue um, that you are fixing. Yeah. Does that work in the, inside the text also? I'm, I'm actually unsure, or does it have to be in the title? Maybe it, it works. In it the works text. in the text, yeah. OK. That's good. what I always do. OK. OK, and then I can click Create Pull Request. So and, um, yeah. yeah. There we go. Yeah. So. Maybe we can summarize what we've done. So Rado, or Giorno made the fork of the repository, yep. used the GitHub web interface to edit a file, and then put it on a new branch, and then made a pull request for this. So we would normally be doing this from the command line, but the web interface worked well for the demo. Yeah. So the web interface works well for small files and um for editing essentially visual content oh, when you don't need to run the code to verify it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in this case, it works quite well. Yeah. OK. So should we go back to Radovan's screen and see what it looks like from there? Sounds great. Taking over. 
here we are. Okay. So now I got notified that there is a new pull request, which also has a number. Mm -hmm. All the issues and all the pull requests are numbered so that we can refer to them. And I can have a look at this. And I can have a look at the title, the description, also the changes, what has changed here. And again, coming back to this collaborative document analogy, so Jano sent made a suggested change in a document, if I think think this way. And now I can we can discuss it. So I can ask more questions, I can give suggestions, but I can also accept it. Um, yeah. Sh should we accept it? Why not? And we there is something here. Hmm. Should we talk about it or not? Maybe some other time. Maybe later. Yeah. So I will. So this merge pull request is the analogy of accepting the change. Mm -hmm. And the moment I will accept it, that moment it will automatically close the issue number one because it understands this text here. Mm -hmm. So let, let's accept. Yeah. Uh, confirm. And now the suggestion is merged into my repository here. Mm -hmm. And if I look at the issues, well, it is still there. Hmm. If you refresh the page. Hmm. Yeah, I think it needs to be in the title. No, I, th I think maybe it's that that which says fixes issue number one instead of fixes number one. Oh, OK. Good. So. Okay. But anyway, no problem. I can. Yeah. I know now that this has been solved in. Mm -hmm. This has been solved in pull request number two. So I can cross the it this way and I can close the issue. So even if it didn't close the issue, um, you do see um, a reference to the pull request in um, in the conversation here. Mm -hmm. Right. That was automatically added. Yeah. Is okay. it useful to have a look at branches or is that too confusing now? No, let's not. We have about 10 minutes left, so maybe we right. should continue. And this leads us to the next step. So the community projects. Let's come back to our notes. Mm. So you might have noticed how easy it was for Radovan to do this. There was basically no work other than clicking something to see what the changes were, and then um, going and clicking Merge. And this is really amazing. And this is why so many big projects are using things like GitHub and GitLab. So I guess the downside is that let's say you make something popular, then people start asking for more and more. They're like, can you do this? Can you do that? Here's all these changes, which you just might not have time for. And that's when it gets really interesting. So you've made something successful. So how can you take full benefit of it? So this kind of thing would be really great for your CV, saying, I've made this very popular project, which is used by everyone. But you have to find a way to make it, like to take advantage of this community for what you need. Like, can you get other people who are maintainers who can review easy pull requests or answer easy questions and things like that? Yeah, also helping with like pull request triage. Um, so as, as you said, some some change suggestions are easier than others. Yeah. Some issues are easier than others. Yeah. And then as as a project grows, then from from a single person to a research group to a community, one also needs to think about. I mean, we definitely need to think about license. We need to think about maybe contribution guidelines. One needs mm -hmm. documentation how to even contribute, where to suggest changes. So licensing is, is a very important point here. So in principle now, since I have contributed to this uh, relevance project and um, the code, um, well, I am an author of a part of the code. If Radovan wanted to publish it or present do anything with it, um, he would need to ask for my permission. Um, so you need to make sure that when people submit uh, make make changes that um, the changes are licensed properly. Yeah. 
so that you can use it and um, that others can use it as well. Yeah. And the convention as clarified in the GitHub terms of service, if you make a pull request to another repository, you're agreeing that the code is licensed under the license of the repository. You're not transferring copyright or anything like that. You're just saying you made something that say MIT license. I'm adding something under MIT license there. And then you have two copyright owners of the project and so on. So this is something that you might need to consider. But it's just the way that open source projects work. So as a project gets big, the standard is distributed copyright, which is all of the contributors have their own copyright to it. And why is this? Well, it's because it's the assurance that you don't come and make whatever it is commercial or remove access from anyone else. So by contributing to a project, I ensure that it will stay open source in the future, which is important to me. Are there any other considerations for these types of things? Um, I would say maybe it is obvious, but good to reemphasize that as the project grows, it becomes more and more important that changes are reviewed mm -hmm. so that all the changes come through these pull requests. And it can be a good moment to start with this already with a small research group. So already, if if you are like three people, even two people, it can be really helpful to use these pull requests, change proposals, because then at least one more person sees it. Mm -hmm. And it can be a great learning opportunity. Yeah. And it becomes, for bigger projects, there is no other way. Then all the, all the changes are reviewed. Mm -hmm. I would also like to mention that we have mentioned issues. And issues, they sound like problems. But we have also said that they can be used for discussions. They can be used for proposals. But on GitHub, there are also the discussions. So one can enable for a project a place which is only for discussions and not for problems. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Because sometimes then, then one can separate really the problems from the questions. So in, in our settings, in our repository setting, you can enable discussions. And then there is an extra, extra tab for like a forum. Yeah. Mm. And questions here really welcome. So thanks for uh, thanks for the questions. Yeah. So in the last few minutes, if there's no, um, please start giving us questions. We can talk about long term and GitHub. So GitHub is basically the de facto place that you find a lot of open source software these days. Um. If you put release something in an article, can you cite it from GitHub? And I can answer the question. And yes, but but it's a problem. It can be a problem because so I think well many people do. They they cite a link to the GitHub repository in an article, but it's it's not enough because there is no guarantee that this will not disappear. I can, right. I can, I can just delete the repository, or I can. Right. So we need, we need to preserve it for longer, for research. So how do we do that? Yeah, yeah. So there is this problem is solved by other services. For example, Zenodo, which is an EU-funded. Uh, scientific data repository. And in fact, there's a way that you can go and link GitHub to Zenodo. So every time you make a release on GitHub, then it will automatically be permanently archived with a DOI on GitHub and then is usable for citations. And after the initial setup, which itself is only a minute or two clicking some buttons, um, it's so every time you publish something on Zenodo, um, that application gets an official um, ISBN number. So mm -hmm. um, in principle, you can permanently cite it even if somehow the data goes away. Yeah. So that tends to be what um, 
what advanced projects will do. If I want to find out, so, so let's say I create this project, and after a while I want to find out who is using it, how would you do it? If you want to know, like, who is he, who is using my project, mm -hmm. that is on GitHub. How do you do that? I guess there's the stars on GitHub, but that's just the people that are actively using GitHub and like to and do that. Following it, forks, of course. If someone it's is forks. really heavily heavily yeah. using it, they might have their own fork. Yeah, but that doesn't list everyone. Mm. But it gives a good idea. I mean, just looking at the forks, looking at the stars, looking at who is citing it. Yeah. So if you have a DUI, you can actually count the citations and yeah. see where, where was it cited from. Yeah. It can be a nice way to start new collaborations. Yeah. If you release your software and put it in a package manager, that package manager can track the number of downloads and installs it gets, which is nice. We mentioned GitHub ac actions quickly. Um, so one more place where you can um, follow how many people are using your things is of course uh, on Zenodo. Um, so if you upload something on Zenodo, it will track downloads and um, it will also track citations. Mm -hmm. So if somebody cites your um, your DOI or your ISBN number in a site in a publication, it will generally be uh, quite well tracked now on Zenodo. Yeah. Yes, but I think a good idea to talk a little bit about actions. Good to know about them. Good to know what it, what it is good for. So this is it's the same idea, but it has different names. So on GitHub, it's called actions, and on GitLab, it's called GitLab continuous integration. Mm -hmm. It's the same idea, so we can. You can define recipes that will be run every time you, for instance, accept a pull request or every time somebody pushes the repository. An example is run a test test set. So typically this is used to test every code change that is pushed. Or you can you can run these tests and see whether everything is still working before accepting the change. Mm -hmm. It can be used for much more than that, but um, so it can also be used to package your code, to upload it to, I don't know, Anaconda or the Python package index. Yeah. So it, it can do a lot more than that. Like, for example, the website of Research Software Hour is automatically updated when we push to a Git repository, and that happens via GitHub Actions. So, yeah. So, um, I guess we can hang around and answer any remaining questions. I've added some um, what's next sources here. So Code Refinery has many lessons about GitHub, which is taught by a lot of the same people you see here. Um, we will do yeah. workshops. Uh, probably it will restart early 2022. But really looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. So there will be online workshops. We also look for if you already know these things, you can contribute as an instructor helper exercise lead. Yeah. Yeah, if you're here, you'll probably get notified about it either via Alto or someone else. Um, yeah, well, I would like to request before you leave please comment in this feedback section about one thing you liked and one thing that can be improved for today. And I will repaste it into the Twitch chat. Mm. So, yeah. Um, Please let us know what you think. I guess we won't hang up right away. And after we see activity dies down, then we can head out. 
this will be recorded and posted so you can send it to others. And there is so much more to say, but we need to we need to come back to these topics in, in later shows. Yeah. I mean, one could talk for hours and hours on, on these topics. Yeah. Like this was really just to give an overview. Yeah. Any one section we gave could easily become a whole hour workshop. If you need practical help on these kinds of things and you're at Alto University, you can reach out to the science IT group or the Alto Research Software Engineers, which someone can point here, and we can help you with these kinds of questions. Mm. The code refinery community is probably happy to try to answer other questions you may have if you're not at Alto. Absolutely. So we have a chat. It'd be great to have questions there about anything programming, computing, data related. Yeah. There's a question in Twitch chat, is SSH the best? And I guess that means is SSH for remote connection, connecting to remote the best? And I think yes. So that's what we would generally recommend. That's what I'm using. I think the tokens are fine, but I'm using SSH. Yeah. Okay, well, we don't see many more questions, so maybe we should thank everyone for coming, and we will see you in a future week. Thanks so much for watching. See you soon on future videos. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye.